Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about a second capital budgeting method called the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return method is by far the most important alternative to the net present value method. It is the most is also one of the most popular methods in practice because it is very easy to explain. The net present value method is a combined valuation. So when a project earns a positive net present value, it earns the minimum required return, which is represented by the discount rate. And then it generates additional value over, over and above that. So it is a slightly more complex concept because it has two valuation combined into one number, whereas the internal rate of return is just a single percentage. Another advantage of the internal rate of return is that it's based entirely on estimated cash flow. So that part of the internal rate of return is good. So how do we use the internal rate of return rule and what it is? By definition, the internal rate of return is the discount rate that sets the net present value to zero. So there's really no calculation per se. The only way that you can find the internal rate of return is by trial and error. So in the old days, it's very difficult to compute the internal rate of return. Today, with the computing technology that we have, you can easily compute the internal rate of return on your financial calculator or uh, on, on using Excel. So if you are using the internal rate of return as your decision criteria, how do you decide if a project is acceptable or not? So as we do with every single method, we want to learn how to compute the metric that we'll use to apply the rule. And the second thing is to learn how to apply the rule to help us decide if we should accept or reject a project. And first, we're going to look at independent projects. When projects are independent, they need to meet a minimum hurdle, a minimum criteria. So for the internal rate of return, that seems intuitive. What return does it have to earn? Well, it has to earn the minimum, which is the required return. And that will be the same required return that you use to compute net present value. So the internal return rate of return method is closely related to the net present value method because you can't really apply this rule unless you know what that minimum required return is. So, and if you have that minimum required return, you, um, you can compute both the net present value and the internal rate of return method. In fact, in most cases, um, capital budgeting projects that I have worked on for companies, I would use at least two or three uh, methods because in real life, a single number does not capture the entire story. We're making decisions about the future. There's a lot of uncertainty. Do the decision rule that we are introducing in this chapter really help us to get a better picture. Um, but this is not, business decision making is not a science. This is, you, you do not just have a number and then you say yes, accept, no, reject. We, what we want to have is a comprehensive picture of what the project is and analyzing it from multiple perspectives. Of course, the project has to meet the minimum acceptance criteria, but we want to see, we want to look at what are the underlying assumptions of each of those criteria and what happens if those assumptions are violated. So meeting the minimum is the first step, but it's not sufficient. It, more importantly, if you have projects that are not independent, but rather are mutually exclusive projects, then we'll need to somehow rank the projects. And if you are using the internal rate of return method, then your ranking criteria will be to select the project with the highest internal rate of return. And in fact, this is where oftentimes uh, this method comes into trouble. Uh, but we, before we get into that, we want to first take a look at uh, how we use this method to evaluate projects. So we will use the same example that we have seen before, so the same set of cash flow. 
And remember that we can own, we cannot compute the internal real return method directly using a formula. The only way we can solve the internal real return is by using a financial calculator. So first, we're going to enter this cash flow. This is the same example you've seen before. So we start with cash flow. And we always clear the work first. With the internal rate return, you must enter cash flow in year zero. So our investment is $165,000. And that is a negative outflow. So we make that negative. Enter. Now we advance to year one, which is $63,120. So enter. Again, advance F01 will be one. And then cash flow two is $70,800. Advance two cash flow three is $91,080. So again, press enter. Now that all our information is enter, what we need to do is compute the internal real return. So that's the IRR function on your calculator. So this is the first time you, we are using this function. So press IRR and then compute. Congratulations, you just computed the internal rate of return for this project. So the internal rate of return in this case is 16.13%. So a very natural question is, should we accept or reject this project? So to make that decision, we have to look at what the required return for this project is. And we know that the required return for this project is 12%. Since this project generates a 16% return when you are requ requiring only 12%. The internal rate of return is greater than your minimum requirement and therefore you will accept this project. So that's the main, so we have figured out how to compute the internal rate of return. We also learn how to apply this number to help us make decision. Next, we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of this method. The biggest disadvantage of the internal rate of return method is that because there's no direct solution, we have to find the internal rate of return through trial and error. And that can result in more than one internal rate of return. And the reason for that has to do with the optimization technique that computer, computer algorithm uses to search for a solution when there's no direct method of calculation. That can be a potential problem, um, but that problem is more immediate be, uh, and more obvious and usually does not cause too much part, too much um damage to your decision making because you either can compute the internal rate of return or you cannot. And if you cannot compute the internal rate of return or your, your calculator or computer uh, tells you that there's no solution, uh, you simply have to move on and use a different method. Uh, more, da more damaging and more, more dangerous is the fact that the internal rate of return method can lead to incorrect decisions when you're comparing mutually exclusive projects. And this one is more um, a conceptual problem, not a calculation problem. Um, the reason for that is if you have two projects with very different size or scale, you can earn a very high return on a small project. Uh, but if the projects are mutually exclusive, then you may accept a small scale project that gives you a high return and reject a large scale project um, that has a lower return in terms of internal rate return, but can generate more dollar in terms of net present value. Um, this, is, this is possible to, even though it is not um, as likely in real life. Um, one of the example um, in real life that I've encountered when working with real life projects that result in this problem is um, comparing automat automated investment versus um, more labor intensive investment. So a more labor intensive investment may require lower investment costs upfront and generate a higher return in terms of percentage. But an automated investment or a more large scale investment may generate a lower percentage return but a higher dollar value in that present value term. So that's one of the mo more common reasons. Um, 
for um, leading to incorrect decisions when comparing mutually exclusive projects. The advantage of an, the internal real return method is that it's easy to communicate. And that's really, um, in businesses, um, being right is important, but being right oftentimes may not matter if you fail to communicate the value of the project. So you remember that a business is made up of many different constituents. So in order for a project to be supported, you need to buy in from upper management, from marketing, from sales, from engineering. Um, and all those constituents oftentimes do not speak the same language. And the more simple the tool for communication, the easier it is to um, get the constituents and all the stakeholders on the same page. And the internal rate of return is a single number, a single percentage, and makes it much easier uh, to communicate the value of the project to stakeholders. Um, the other uh, is that it is a good method and it has solid economic um, principles behind the internal rate of return and it leads to correct decisions when you are evaluating independent projects with conventional cash flow. So conventional cash flow, this is a special keyword um, in, in this chapter. So conventional cash flow here means that the cash flow change sign only once. So what that means is it, it refers to a very traditional project where you have investment upfront. So you have negative cash flow in the beginning of the project. And then once the project kick into gear, you have positive cash flow ongoing. So instead of cash flow that goes positive, negative, and back and forth throughout its life, a conventional cash flow is one that you invest money and have negative cash flow in the initial years, and they become positive in subsequently and doesn't change sign again. So most projects, at least at the outset when you are estimating a project. So again, we are talking we're talking about projected cash flows, not um not reality. So in, when you're projecting a project, this is what we typically expect to happen. So the internal way of return rule is applicable to um a large number of projects.